Amen. If you'll go ahead and take your Bibles, <clears throat> I want you to stand and go to me the New Testament to the book of John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We'll begin looking at verse 11. John chapter 15 and verse 11. The Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And so... He's talking about the things he's previously spoke to them, and he's talking to them about their joy, and that's what we're going to deal with today, but it's abiding. We've been talking about abiding because that, that word is used multiple times here, and that's the key to this passage of Scripture is abiding in him, and we see a, we're going to be abiding in his pleasure, in his pleasure, what he wants for us, and then we abide in that, and he gives us what we need in his joy in our life. Let's pray. Father... We thank you for your word today. Thank you that we might be able to open it and that we can do that and that we can receive from what your word says to us. Uh, Would you be very thorough with us today, specifically about our joy and what you want for our life? And would we come to know your joy in a very intimate, very real, powerful way in our life? even during a time when circumstances aren't what they or we would like them to be around this world and in our personal lives. But, Lord, help us to have your joy. Help us to abide in you. Help us to find you faithful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I want you to go back to John chapter 14 with me because... What we're, what we're finding here in the greater context of John chapter 15 is that Jesus just told his disciples that he'd be leaving this world. And uh, that wasn't very comforting to them because uh, that's all they knew. Since he called them and walked with them, that's what they knew. That was their comfort. That was their um, security was in the Lord. And now he's telling them, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Well, he didn't just tell them that he was leaving. He told them that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would come and be with them. And so he's telling them and talking to them about this. And uh, and we find that in, let's just read several verses here in John chapter 14, beginning in verse number 1. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, You should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Let's jump down to verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Look at verse 18. So he's talking about leaving. (laughs) Good thing is he said, I'm coming again. I'm coming back. And in verse 18, he said this, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live. Ye shall live also. Now go down to verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. By the way, it's the second time he said, let not your hearts be troubled in this passage of scripture. 
Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So even though this was serious, a very serious and very sad discussion he's having with his disciples, Jesus wanted them to know that they could have his joy during this time and for the rest of their lives. Because he was leaving, but the Holy Spirit, which was another comforter, which was the same kind of comfort because we understand that Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and God the Father is God. And uh, not three gods, one God. And um, he's living in us now in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so we have that same comfort, that same security and everything we need in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he can be with all of us at the same time all around the world with every believer. That he's not... He's not bound to one place like Jesus was in, in the flesh there. And so we find this joy that he wanted to leave them. And he's, and he's laying this out here in progression in chapter 15. And he talks more about it in chapter 16 uh, when he's talking to them and making preparations for him being gone and for them to not have him anymore here on earth. Now joy, when we're talking about this joy, is true happiness. And it does not change with circumstances we all have different circumstances. It does not change with problems. We all have problems <clears throat> uh, or events in life. Well, all of us have events that are taking place in our life. Some of them we like, some of them we don't like. But our joy was never contingent on whether we liked something or didn't like it. It's always contingent on the Lord and the Holy Spirit that dwells in us and are we abiding in Him is what He's talking about. I want you to see something in Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3, <clears throat> if you just write that down, maybe go later to look at it. But Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 17 it says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, that's not good. And there's a bunch of not good things that are going on here. Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He said, when the bad times are here, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to have joy. He said, the Lord God is my strength. Not those things that he just aforementioned. And he will make my feet like hind's feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. So we can rejoice because of who the Lord is and what the Lord will do. That's why Habakkuk was talking about rejoicing, because there were some bad times coming. And if things continue on the way they are, some worse times are coming uh, for us. But we can rejoice. But we cannot rejoice, or if we cannot rejoice, when all appears to be well, then how do we expect to rejoice when we are in the midst of a storm? But sometimes that's the way we think about it. I'm good right now. And if you're in a good place right now, great. But rejoice. <laughs> rejoice. You still need the joy of the Lord in the good place. But when the bad place comes, when the storm comes, yes, that'll drive you to the Lord. But that's not the only time you should be to the Lord. You should be abiding in Him already. And you should be rejoicing. And by the way, if you're going to rejoice, that means you already have to be in the joy. Sometime in your life, if you're going to re-up it, right? Rejoice means you already have joy. And it might be down a little bit, but you rejoice. That's why we're always supposed to be rejoicing. is because we're supposed to be in that joy over and over and over again. And, uh, and so we're looking at this joy that we should have in our Christian life. And it comes from abiding. And the Christian life will not be a duty... It will not be a duty, but a delight when we abide in the Lord's pleasure and His joy in our life. Now, I've experienced the Christian life being a duty. You probably have too. There are things, I've got to do this. But there are what we would call duties. There are things that the Lord asks us to do. But they are not, they doesn't have to be grievous to us if we're abiding in Him. I don't, I don't think I've ever 
been abiding in Christ and found anything in the Christian life, anything he tells me to do, to be a burden to me. But outside of abiding in him, my flesh finds a burden in everything. Everything. And you're probably the same way. You've experienced the same thing. So first of all, I want to look back at John chapter 15 and verse 11. And the Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you. These things. So first of all, we look at the conditions for joy. The conditions for joy. The Lord speaks and we need to listen to him. You know, he speaks to us for a reason. When he's directing you and he's guiding you through his word or whatever, there, he's, he's speaking to you. And he said, these things have I spoken unto you. So Jesus is saying, I have spoke to you, and you need to be listening to what I spoke. Sometimes we listen to everything but Jesus Christ. There's a lot, there's a lot of voices in our lives today. I guess more now than any other time in human history. And it just keeps getting more every day with media and all of the social platforms we can be on, all of the news. Um, everything is at our fingertips, and so everything is trying to speak to us. I was just having a conversation with my brother the other day, and, um, and we were talking about how burdensome information is, how being so burdened down with things, um, and, and we kind of come to that spot where we're so burdened down with everything um, that we can't do what we ought to be doing because it's so sidetracked us if we're not careful. And the world is constantly trying to speak to us. You know, the world's got a message, and it's not the message of Jesus Christ. It never has been, it never will be. And uh, it might sometimes seem similar to that because the world's message is going to be a deceiving message. And it has to be close to it sometimes, and sometimes it's totally opposite, and that's where the world really does lie. And, um, and I don't mean lies and tell a falsehood, I mean that's where it sits and that's where it stands as opposed to Christ. It has that spirit of Antichrist, the world does, and the system thereof. And so the Lord speaks to us every day, but we don't listen. He is speaking to us. He didn't stop speaking when the book of Revelation... Now, I'm not saying he's given us extra biblical revelation today. I'm saying when he stopped with his written word, he didn't stop speaking to believers. He didn't stop guiding us with his Holy Spirit or any of that. When, the book, when his word was written. The Lord might speak to us. Listen, he might use circumstances in your life. And he's going to speak to you. So pay attention. Now, I'm not saying go um, super uh, mystical on me. And every little circumstance has something from God in it. Because that would be silly as well. Oh, something happened. Well, you know, a black cat come on the side of the road. Somebody's going to die today. I don't know what your superstitious people, but we don't have to be superstitious about things. Or everything has a meaning to it in our life, right? If we, if we, if we see these things. But circumstances, the Lord absolutely uses those in our life. He also speaks to us through other believers. Has the Lord ever used another believer to help you? Yes, he's used the believers in my life too to help me many times to speak something. But you know how most of, sometimes it's something that I didn't even think about, sometimes. But this is usually how it works. If I walk with God and abide with Him, the Lord's putting things on my heart. And then somebody else is walking with the Lord, the Lord's putting something on their heart. And it happens to be the same thing. So when they come to talk to me, or I go talk to them, we figure out the Lord's doing the same thing. And that helps to confirm things. In, in, in a way there in our lives. So I like to see that. I like to see that with my wife and I. I like to see that in my family. I like to see that with church family, other believers, how the Lord works that out. You know, sometimes the Lord uses an, um, an unbeliever in my life. I've had the Lord to rebuke me through an unbeliever before. I've had the Lord show me some things about myself through an unbeliever. And so, but that's not usually how he works it. It's usually through someone walking with him, another believer there. Um, but the Lord might speak to you through his word, and I think that's where he mostly will speak to us and change us and turn us and direct our mindset and our lives is through his word, and we ought to be careful to be in his word. And he said, these things have I spoken unto you. He is speaking to us, just like he spoke with his disciples. He wants to speak with us. So we need to hear 
We need to hear the word of God. <clears throat> I think this is how he speaks mostly to us, by the way. So we need to put ourselves in a position that we hear the word of God daily. What are you doing to hear the word of God? Might be that you're reading the word of God and you're hearing it. But what are you doing to hear it? You know, I have, I have an app on my phone and I listen to the word of God. So I listen to it um, amongst reading it. We'll talk about that in a second, but listening to it. I listen to people preach the word of God. Yeah, guess what? I need preaching too. <laughs> I need to hear from somebody else besides myself preaching and, and hearing it. Um, but the word of God, are you hearing it? Is this the only time you hear it in Sunday school or in Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Is this it? You need to hear it every day. You need to have the word of God being pumped into you every day. Outside of your reading, outside of what's going on, you need to set aside some time where you listen to the word of God. Then we need to believe the word of God. So what are you going to do with it when you hear it? There is always a response that needs to take place. Always a response. Now, Jesus was speaking to them. They heard it, but they, there's a response to it. And the response is, you need to abide. You need to abide to what I'm telling you. And we need to make up our mind that whatever the Word of God says, it's true and it's right. That's it. It doesn't change. It's true and it's right. And if, and if we need to also make up our mind that it is the Word, uh, in the Word, where we find our joy. Through the written word, through the living word, through the imparted power of the Holy Spirit in our life. So we hear it, we believe it, we respond to the word of God. What does that mean? It means we obey it. Hey, now you can respond to God's word and disobey it. But I'm saying you need to respond to the word of God and obey it. This is where the conditions of joy come out of. Our abiding in him. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we're talking about hearing it, believing it, and responding to it. So the very first verse talks about responding. And then it goes backwards. It goes all the way back to hearing it. But listen what it says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the response. How then shall they call on him and who they have not believed? There's the believing. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Well, there you go. You've got to hear, you have to believe, and then you can respond to it. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And we've got to go preach. How shall, and how shall they preach except they be sent? So if we're sent, then we've got to respond to it. There's another response that needs to be made. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So there is a hearing, there is a believing, and there is a responding to the word of God. And we need to understand that the Lord gives us a free will, meaning we are able to make our own choices. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful thing. If he didn't do that, we'd all be robots. That's what we would be. And we would have no choice, and we would be lockstep. And now he wants us to be doing the same thing in our life, obeying him, abiding in him, but he gives us a free will in doing so. And so we respond positively to the Lord when he speaks to us, and it's our choice. So that's the choice we ought to be making. There are conditions attached to the joy that Jesus wants us to have in our life. And we need to meet the condition of abiding in Jesus so that we can abide in his pleasure. And we can have his joy in our life. He goes on and he says this. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. So I've told you these things. I've told you some conditions. You need to hear them. You need to receive them. You need to respond correctly to them. And then he said that my joy might remain in you. So the constancy of joy. The constancy of joy. He said he wants it to remain in you. Constancy. The Lord's joy remains in us when we exercise faith in his word. Look at uh, Philippians with me. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you 
which was also in Christ Jesus. He's always trying to develop the way we think into the way he thinks. I don't know of a better way to do that. Well, of course, abiding, because then his Holy, the Holy Spirit of God can direct the way we think, and our because that's what he's trying to do, lead us and guide us. But when we read his word, you know what we find out? We find out how the Lord thinks, because this is his word. When he tells us about something that happened, that thing that happened might be bad, but he tells us what he thinks about it. So when we find out what God thinks about something by reading his word, then how should we think about it? The same way, right? That should be our mind. So as we read the Bible, we start understanding how he thinks about it, and then our mind changes to his mind. That's always what he's trying to do. He's trying to work in us that we have the mind of Christ. And if we have that mind, then we'll have his joy. As we abide in him, we're going to have this joy. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That means we want to believe, but we don't believe. We have a mind, we're saying we want this, but we're not willing to meet the conditions. A double-minded man is unstable. We cannot let our emotions dictate our joy. So often we do. Oh, we don't feel good, so I can't have joy inside of me because I don't feel good. Now, I don't want you to equate joy with smiling 24 hours a day. Okay? That's not joy. Now, joy will cause you, I think, to smile. There are times you're going you're gonna to be joyful with that, but you don't have to. You don't have to. But I do find that whenever I'm abiding in the Lord and walking with Him, I do have a smile about things. I do see things even when they're going bad. I do see good in it. I do see the Lord working. And so there can be joy there, but don't let your emotions dictate your joy but we should let our abiding in Christ dictate our emotions. That's where we go really bad and really difficult about things. Well, I don't feel like. So then you say that means I'm not. But that's not true either. There are times when we're burdened down with things in our life and we're heavy. And there's a time to cry and there's a time not to cry, right? There's a time for these things to happen in your life. But you can still have God's joy in the midst of natural emotion of crying, right? You can still have that. And uh, we, we have to let our abiding in Christ dictate our emotions. And as we hear, as we believe and obey the word of God, then his joy will remain in us. I'm going to give you one reason why his joy is going to remain in us. As we do that, because what he's telling us to do is to abide. And if we are abiding in him... Look at Galatians chapter 5. This is what's happening. It means we're walking in the Spirit. If we're abiding in Him, it's synonymous with walking in the Spirit. And the Bible says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then what's the second one? Joy. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So, if we are abiding in Him, then we will be abiding in joy because the Holy Spirit is living in us and His fruit is joy. That's what we will have in our life. That's what will be there and we need that. So the, Lord, the Lord's joy remains in us as we exercise faith in His Word, but the Lord's joy also prevails over any heartache in our life. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12 <clears throat> and verse 2. The Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now listen to what this says. Right in the middle, he's the author and finisher of our faith, but it says this, For the joy, who for the joy, talking about Jesus, for, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now do you think the cross was joy? I mean, was that a heartache? Was that a time of heartache? Yes. yes, it was a time of physical heartache for the Son of God. 
to be beaten, to be put to death, to be crucified, everything that he went through physically, it was not a pleasant time. There was a lot of heartache. And that's not even where it ends. But it says this, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. His joy was the joy of us. His joy was not going to the cross. His joy was not dying physically. His joy was not on the cross before he gave up the ghost that he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was a spiritual separation. A time where he was separated from God the Father. Do you think that was joy to him? Never before had that ever been the case. And never is after that. That wasn't joy to him. <clears throat> he went and he died for our sins on the cross because we are joy to him. Because he loves us. He knew what the outcome was going to be. And it was a great heartache though, but the Bible says that Jesus had that joy. What cross are you bearing today? What thing are you carrying today? Look what it says in the next verse. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So just like Jesus, we are to consider him because when we do, we can endure through whatever it is, and we might have his joy when we're considering him. We want his joy. We need his joy when we're going through the things that we have to deal with in life. The constancy of his joy. Not that you have it one day and then it's not there for a week and then you have it again and it's not there for a week and we have it again. It's up and it's down and all around. No, the constancy of it. That's the Christian life. Consistent. Consistent abiding. Consistent walking with the Lord. Look at Psalm 30 and verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but what? Joy, <laughs> Joy cometh in the morning. By the way, the morning's coming. The morning's coming. The joy is there. He wants you to have it. And when we're experiencing the darkness of life, we can be assured that joy is coming in the morning. Constancy of joy. He said that my joy might remain in you. That's a promise. The things I've wrote unto you, I've spoken these things unto you. Are you going to hear them? Are you going to believe them? Are you going to respond to them? If so, if you will abide in me, then my joy might remain in you. And then he says, and that your joy might be full. Your joy might be full. So now we see the completeness of his joy. That your joy might be full. The world cannot offer a full or complete joy. It never has. It never will be able to offer that full joy. We're deceived and we think, Sometimes it does have that for us, but it doesn't. The world cannot offer a full or complete joy. It only offers this, a cheap substitute. What it would call happiness. But really, it's just the gratification of our lust of our flesh. That's what the world can offer. And is there pleasure in sin? You help me. Yes, there is pleasure in sin. Uh, Moses said there's pleasure in sin for a season. Yes, there's pleasure in sin. Why do, well, if it wasn't, then why would we do it? And the devil has set it up in such a way that he knows that we have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those are the three areas that branch out into every sin that he can get us in, that he can set the snare and the trap and his methods. So yes, there's pleasure in it, but it's only a cheap substitute. It will never be joy in our life. Would never be joy. If you take the thing in your life that you could do without God that's making you happy, if it was taken away, then you wouldn't have happiness anymore. That's not true joy. 
You could take everything away in your life, and if you're abiding in Christ, you still have joy. If you took everything away, I'm talking about if you're like Job, and everything got taken from you, you still have joy. If you have Christ, and then you're applying that by abiding in Him. So when the fun's over, and the happiness is gone, the feeling of emptiness comes. That's how you know that that was of the flesh. Whatever that is in your life. That you're trying to get joy out of, but you're not finding it. Because after it's all done, emptiness comes in. Jesus never leaves you empty. You still have the joy. You know, if we, as believers, we can have fun, right? When the fun's done, there's no emptiness. There's no, there's no guilt. There's no guilt. When you leave church service today, the only reason you'd feel guilty today is if you left and you said no to God. There'd be no reason for any believer to ever to come to church service and leave and feel guilty about coming to church service. There's nothing to be guilty about. Meeting with God, let Him speak to you. Look at Psalm 16 and uh, verse 11. The Bible says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We're talking about abiding in His pleasure. At His right hand. Do you want the joy? You want the fullness of joy? You've got to have His presence. If you don't have His presence, if I don't have His presence, there is not going to be any joy. No joy for you, no joy for me. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You want strength? Have the joy of the Lord. You want the joy of the Lord? You get into His presence. How do you get into the presence of God? Abiding in Him. You believe it by faith. You yield to Him and not your flesh. You abide in Him. You abide in His pleasures. And when we're full of the joy of the Lord and the temptations come, we'll have strength to walk away from those sins and those temptations. I hope you experience that in your life, that you can have the strength to do that. When we are satisfied in our life by Jesus, nothing else will satisfy us. You know, when I got saved, I found that out to be true as I started abiding in the Lord. Now, there wasn't anything special about me. I just found out that very early on as a believer. And I started yielding to Christ, and the satisfaction I found in Him took away the satisfaction for sin. And He started separating me from sins, and it's not because I found that He told me not to do them. It's because I wanted just to be with Him, and I didn't want to do those things anymore. And I found everything that I'd been looking for in Him. And so I didn't have to have all the other things anymore in my life. And He gives me victory. I still live in the flesh, but He gives me victory. And if we're not experiencing joy, then this is the bottom line. We're not abiding in Him. No joy, no abiding. Put an equal sign in between those. No joy, no abiding. That's where we're at in our life. So as we abide in Christ, we hear His Word, we obey His Word, we'll find constant and complete joy for which our heart is longing. He's put that in us, and He's the only one that can fill it, fulfill it in our lives. Father, thank You for Your Word this morning. Please help us to respond to it accordingly. That would please You by faith. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Brother Justin... I'm lost. I'm on my way to hell this morning. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I've never believed on the, what you talked about, His death, burial, and resurrection. I didn't understand that He did that with joy for me, and He died, and He was buried and raised from the dead. But I understand that this morning, and I need to, I need to make my 
I need to make myself right with God by receiving His Son, Jesus Christ. But anybody say that this morning? I don't know Jesus, but I sure would like to know that I know Him. Anybody like that this morning? Believers, what are you going to do with, with what you've heard this morning? What has the Lord spoke to you about? Are you hearing the Word of God every day? Is there a purposeful time? Hey, if you need something to listen to, I can recommend some things to you. If you say, well, I don't know where to go, I can recommend some safe things to you that's going to give you the Word of God and not a lot of other things. Do you believe the Word of God when you hear it? Now, that's a hard issue. Are we going to believe it, what the Lord says? And are you obeying the Word of God when you hear it? Now, is your joy consistent, and is your joy complete? Answer those questions, and you have the answer that the Lord wants you to have this morning about are you abiding in Him? There's a lot of things we already looked at that come out of abiding. This is one of them, and it's wonderful that His joy remains in you and in me. Father, again, thank you for your word. Oh, I pray that we respond correctly to it this morning in a positive way, saying yes to you. Please let that be our heart attitude. Help us have victory and strength over sin that wants to deceive us and offer us some kind of happiness or fulfillment, which it never does. Please help us to see through that, Lord, and to go to you as, as soon as possible when temptations come, to find the strength that we need, because your joy is our strength. Lord, help us to be a mindful people of our needfulness of abiding in you. Please guide us in this today. Please guide our thoughts this morning. Prepare us for the service to come. We love you. We thank you for dying for us, being buried and raising from the dead to pay for our sins. Help us to live in an abiding fashion this week and this day. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Till we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.